Hi, everyone. We're going to do a history of the history on the Ebionites, and we're going to try to learn what are their doctrines, what were their doctrines about Jesus Christ, what was their doctrines about uh, the virgin birth, what was their doctrines about the law, what was their doctrines about uh, what law applied to Gentiles, if that's even mentioned, and, uh, and then what are some of the scurrilous charges that were brought against them. We're going to see a couple of those in this first episode. They're unbelievable, and they're self-contradictory. And then in the course of this, we're going to have to ask ourselves in the back of our minds, are the Constantinian Christians from the 380s projecting, doc, going back in time and corrupting uh, uh, works written by people who had no intention to say the words that are now in their own writings? So it looks as if they're, uh, are, they're writing. We saw that happen with Oregon, right? Oregon got co-opted by Rufinus in the 380s. He changed him. He made him look like a Trinitarian when he was a anti-Trinitarian, when we finally, his, his original writings that were uh, corrupted, we saw the original versions of them and they didn't have anything that Rufinus put in there. And they were the opposite of what Rufinus did. So there was a corrupting of actually the documentary record. So we can't understand even our past because of actions like Rufinus. Anyway, we're going to look at the article I have online about the Ebionites and the law and Paul, and the other important issue is the Ebionites were uniformly against Paul as an apostate. And before I read these things, just the, the word apostate comes from Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 1 to 10. If you don't know what they are, you should read them one of these days. And basically, I'll just tell you in a synopsis, it says, you know, if some prophet comes to you and he tells you something that uh, prophesies something will come to pass, and it comes to pass. And he even has signs and wonders. But if that prophet teaches you not to follow the law I'm giving you here today, this is Yahweh speaking, the law meaning the Ten Commandments, you know, the Sabbath command, the, the honoring your parents, no idolatry, all of that. If that prophet teaches you not to obey those commands anymore, then you are to treat him as an apostate and kill him. Give him a trial. But if you can prove he actually taught against the Sabbath, for example, said you don't have to do it, and it's for your benefit. So why do you want, why why should you resist God's command to, to take a break? But regardless, the the if you hear such a prophet and he tells you that you are to regard him as an apostate, that means he's turning away completely from the law. It's not that he's disputing how to read or understand the law or sees an exception or. No, this is a person who says, I, I don't want to, that law is dead and gone. I don't have to follow it. You know, it's, I'm not following it at all. That person, God said, is an apostate. That's what the finding is through, uniformly through all the documentation. So at the end of this, you're going to see that one thing is very consistent. And so as the church, the church initially was not pro-Paul. Okay, just so you know, the, the main church, the Ebionite church, they're not pro-Paul. They're the, they're the people who made these findings about Paul. Um, so where is the, you're, you're going to see all kinds of scurrilous charges from people who are in the 100s, the mid 100s, Arrhenius and all those kinds. Of, I mean, over the top, crazy charges. Where is that coming from? It's coming from the future into the past. And I'll make notes of it as we go along. So just to always bear in mind, I'm going to read it as it, it reads. And then you and I have to assess where is this coming from? Is this something that's happening in the 100s or is it something that happened 200 years later and was written into our past to, to make us hate the Ebionites if we, if, we, if we wanted to? All right. Anyway, so we're going to start here. Uh, the Ebionites are the first Christians. And so in G. Ulharn's uh, article, Ebionites in the book, A Religious Encyclopedia or Dictionary of Biblical, Historical, Doctrinal and Practical Theology, third edition, edited by Philip Schaff, as mainstream as you get, Protestant, volume two at pages 684 to 685, and we have a PDF at this link, and you can read this if you want to. It's, it's at our uh, web uh, webpage, jesuswordsonly.github.io. You'll have to search around for early church views of the law. And it says this, Ebionites, this designation was at first, like Nazarenes, a common name for all Christians. As Epiphanius testifies, at verses Her Hereticus 29, uh, verse 1, and just so we know is this was the name of the church, just like you might say there's the Lighthouse Church down the street, which, you know, turn left and go two blocks and you'll find it. So you have a name for a church. The church was named the Ebion, the poor, and therefore the, uh, and that's a Hebrew word, Ebion, for the poor. And so that's how people identified not, uh, all Christians. They were the people who were associated with that particular church. 
it says here, it is derived from the Hebrew word ebion, meaning poor, and was not given as Oregon supposes for their low view of Christ. It's page 684. So did Oregon actually give a low opinion, say the ebion were called the poor because they had a low view of Christ? Unlikely. Why? Because Oregon is the one of the main targets of Rufin is from the 380s who went back in time and corrupted everything that uh, Oregon wrote. So that he, he sounded as if he was a Trinitarian when he was an anti-Trinitarian. And Oregon was a very influential writer. So going back and corrupting all his works, which are all in Greek, when he translated them, when um, Rufinus in the 380s translates them into Latin, he then destroys all the original Greek, and he thinks he's going to get away with it. The problem for Rufinus is, this is what I love about God, it's always going to come out, out of the dirt came the Greek manuscripts that he had thrown away and destroyed. There were some left, and they showed that he was a, a huge corrupter of Oregon. And so now we know the rest of that story. So do I believe Oregon ha said that the, uh, the Ebionites had a low view of Christ? No, I do not think so. And, and I have good reason to doubt anything that Oregon says that, that we need to take anything he says anymore of any validity because of what Rufinus did, which is unquestionable. Okay, so, so, over 100 years later in about 180 AD, Arrhenius, bishop from Gaul, known as France today, clearly describes those who persisted in the designation as Ebionites rejected Paul and followed the law, relying upon Matthew's gospel. And against heresies, book one, uh, chapter 26, 1.26, Arrhenius says, those who are called Ebionites agree that the world was made by God, but their opinions with respect to the Lord are similar to those of Serenthus and Carpocrates. We're going to see what that is, and we're going to uh, uh, be able to make a conclusion of where that came from. Is that from the past? Excuse me, is that from that period, or is somebody <laughs> trying to rewrite the past? They use the gospel according to Matthew only and repudiate the apostle Paul. That's consistent with all other sources, so that seems very valid. Maintaining that he was an apostate from the law, I described that to you. That's Deuteronomy 13, 1 to 10. As to the prophetical writings, they endeavor to expound them in a somewhat singular manner. They practice circumcision, persevere in the observance of those customs which are enjoined by the law. So basically, they're following the Mosaic law. Uh, and are so Judaic in their style of life that they even adore Jerusalem as if it were the house of God. Well, that, you know, there's a lot of interesting things there, but one thing is that shows anti-Semitism by Arrhenius in the 180 period, that doing something Judaic is somehow a slander of you. No, that came from Constantine in his speech at Nicaea, why we wouldn't be allowed to worship uh, uh, at Passover time anymore. He's taking that away from us. He's saying, you cannot have anything in common anymore with the fratric fratricide or par parricide, you know, killing your parent. Uh, murderous Jews. That's Those are his words. Very high, uh, highly anti-Semitical uh, ruler, evil man to the core, not a Christian, pretender, faker, liar, everything. And we have we have episode after episode that proves that beyond a reasonable doubt, he was lying to everybody. And he had power to shut everybody up because of the people, the people who didn't want to go along with him. And I say, the five who wouldn't go along got exiled out of the empire, which meant a death sentence unless he would free of them. Apparently, somebody persuaded him to let them come back later. But that doesn't change the fact that the people who were there are all agreed and consented under compulsion, not by free will. Anyway, and that means he knew he was forcing them to do something they wouldn't want to do, but for force. Just think about that. Uh, so anyway, uh, so, but here, so you see anti-Semitism that doesn't make sense in that era. The church was still cl close to its original roots, would not have been anti-Semitic and say, oh, it's so Judaic that they, they, they look towards Jerusalem to say their prayers is what actually is going on here. As if, as if Jerusalem were the house of God, as if, as if it isn't, because it depends what year we're looking at. If it's 130, well, you know, uh, God's house may not be there, but God's people and God's, uh, the capital of God's world is Jerusalem as far as the, uh, even when you read the book of Revelation, that's what you, you, that's how we would understand it. If we lived in that vicinity, that's what we would do. Okay. So anyway, this is just shows you there's already problems going on. And I'm going to, I'm going to read you about Serenthus and Carpocrates in a minute. And the last quote I'm going to provide, well, a couple quotes here. This is comparable to Eusebius, who in 325 wrote in Ecclesiastical History, Book 3, chapter 27, 3.27, quote, 
These men, moreover, thought it was necessary to reject all the epistles of the apostle Paul, whom they called an apostate from the law. So that's consistent with Arrhenius. And they used only the so-called gospel according to the Hebrews. And I would take out the word so-called. So did Eusebius really say that or not? We'll just assume he did and made small account of the rest. Uh, and so that's not fair. They didn't make small account of the rest. They said, hey, we agree the Luke's gospel is a good gospel and we're okay with that. And why? Because now we know why, because in the book by Professor Evans, the Synecdoche, Synoptic Tradition and the Hebrew Matthew. You should everybody should really get that book. I know it's a hardbound book and it's a very scholarly book, but he proves there that the Book of Luke was a translation of the Hebrew Matthew, and that's why it's <laughs> the, the 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 early church, the Ebionites, agreed this should be read. This is okay to read. And if if you start paying attention to uh, some of the passages I keep emphasizing, like the, the episode we just did on grace, the four times the word grace appears is in the uh, Jesus uses it in is in the Book of Luke, but it's the opposite <laughs> usage that Paul made of the very same word. So anyway, this is. Um, this is not, my view is he probably didn't say so-called gospel. And also at that time, what when he is writing, the the esteem that is starting to increase for this gospel is growing because people are realizing, hey, you know, we need to clear up some of these corruptions and, and interpolations that ended up in the Greek Matthew. And if we could just go back to the original one, that'd be great. Well, that's exactly what the Ebionites did. They claimed, and they were doing this, and, and uh, Jerome confirmed it later. They kept the original Greek, excuse me, the original Hebrew Matthew in a library at Caesarea under basically a lock and key with a person who's, you know, it was like his house maybe or something, but to guard it. And so people couldn't access it without permission. And this way, this was their plan of never letting it be corrupted, because if it were kept in one place, nobody could, you know, corrupt it. So if somebody made a copy and then tried to change it in their reproductions, they could always scream, holy murder, you know, no, no, they're lying. We have our, our book over here. You can't do that. And that's actually what happened, ladies and gentlemen, with the virgin birth. Sorry to tell you again, they screamed and yelled when it was changed to Brown 180. And they said, no, no, no. And Symmachus came to their aid. And uh, he was a famous Jewish translator of the Hebrew Bible into Greek. And he said, hey, this translation from, from uh, uh, Isaiah 7, verse 14, this is not about a virgin. This is about a, a, a woman who's married. It's actually Isaiah's wife. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and Christians just never read the context. If you read just chapter seven, chapter eight, you see Emmanuel is uh, 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 the the wife of Isaiah has a baby, and it's named Ma Emmanuel. And when that child reached thirteen, the prophecy was fulfilled in in Isaiah eight. So I mean, all those things are in the background here. Lots of things go on that we just are kept in the dark, and that's just another example of it. But that was part of the the message of the Ebionites is there was a corruption of their uh, gospel that they had preserved and kept protected under lock and key in Caesarea. And when Jerome in three, 383 to 393, I think it was in 390, he finally gets to go take a look. He makes a complete translation of it. He loves it. He puts it in, he mentions it 22 times in his commentaries. He's correcting the Hebrew, he's correcting the Greek Matthew over and over again as he's making the Latin Vulgate. Uh, but what happens? His version, he translates it completely from Hebrew into Greek. He translates it completely into Latin, and both copies are gone. And that's what I call the Constantinian purge, because the Constantinian church, even though Jerome is post-Constantine, that mentality that we can't allow anything that's, quote, heretical get out into the open has to be destroyed. And that's what ends up happening under Theodosius. And that regime goes from the 380s all the way to the 400s, post Jerome. And they were the great destroyers of libraries. And they would go to town to town and burn books and destroy them, anything that was considered heretical. And people would actually come out of their houses and hand them the books because they didn't want to be arrested and, and punished for holding on to a heretical book. So we, there was a horrible terror that went through the whole thing. And that's why all these books are destroyed. But God's great because oftentimes these things come out of the woodwork. Hopefully one day the, the Hebrew Matthew will come completely out of the woodwork. It, it has, in a sense, with uh, Professor Howard's book uh, on the Shem Tov, but that's that's a much more complicated story. All right, and just uh, maybe one more quote here from Professor James Dunn. 
he notes the original Jewish core of the church regarded Paul as an apostate. He says, quote, the most direct heirs of the Jewish Christian groupings within earliest Christianity. What does he mean? He means the early, can't just say the early Christian Jerusalem church, but that's what he means. Regarded Paul as the great apostate and arch enemy, citing Epistola Petri, that is the letters of Peter, 2.3, Clementine Homily 17, verses verses 18 to 19, or not verses 18 to 19, uh, I guess you could say chapters 18 to 19, James D. G. Dunn, The Cambridge Compa Companion to St. Paul, Cambridge University Press, 2003, at page two. All right, now I want to go back and I want to show you, are we getting a fair presentation, even just in these couple of quotes? These are the main quotes that if you need to study, you know, what do they stand for? You, you, this tells you that they're the center of our church. They repudiated Paul. They believed in the law given Moses was still in effect which would can be comport with Jesus, right? Matthew 5, verse 17 to 19, and uh, also Matthew 19 and Luke 16, where the law is used to tell people how to have eternal life. And, and Jesus gives him what? Which commands? He quotes from the Ten Commandments. Oh, oh, really? Yeah, that's right. And if you go to Isaiah 56, uh, verse 6, what's the thing that the, Jew, the Gentiles must do in order to have eternal life? Keep the Sabbath and obey the, quote, covenant, which is a shorthand term for what? What did the, what did the Jewish people do at the bottom of the mountain? And what, was the, what, what had been given as a law to that point? And then they had, they had all agreed to a covenant? <gasps> yes, it was the Ten Commandments. So that's what God said. If the Gentiles would follow the... The law at that at Sinai, that was given at Sinai and the Sabbath, they would be welcomed into his home. Now that doesn't mean you can violate all the other laws, but the consequence of both disobeying them is not a entry or disentry or exclusion or entry issue if you violate some of the other laws. But they have their own serious consequences in the, in the law and in in our spiritual lives. So anyway, that's. That's it in a nutshell. But I want you to now hear about the this group. Uh, the first, we're going to read about um, Serinthus, and I, I'm going to say this: Serinthus. We're going to learn about it. Sounds almost like an Ebionites, <laughs> but throwing in Carpocrates has to be somebody from the future trying to just smear and slam the Ebionites with this reference because it's a crazy, crazy reference. Wait till you hear it. Okay, I'm going to stop. Okay, so now uh, we'll take a look at uh, who is Serinthus. He flourished in around 100 AD, so this is very close to the early church. Christian heretic, heretic? Wait till, wait till you see this. Is this heresy? Whose errors, according to the theologian Arrhenius, led the apostle John to write his New Testament gospel. So John had to write a gospel to correct them, apparently. Serentis was probably born a Jew in Egypt. Little is known of his life save that he was a teacher and founded a short-lived sect of Jewish Christians with Gnostic tendencies. So they thought you could be saved by having some knowledge about something? I don't think so. He apparently thought that the world was created by angels. Well, that would be wrong. God created it. From whom the Jews received their imperfect law? Well, that's wrong. God didn't create an imperfect law. Who is talking here? The only New Testament writing that Serentis accepted was the Gospel of Matthew. Okay, that's true. That was at that time. There was only one Gospel at that time. There was no John originally. Now, one, by the way, flourished 100 AD means John's Gospel probably hasn't even been written. So that's he's right. John's Gospel comes after this guy. But is he rebutting him or something? Who knows? Uh, ah, he was the offspring of Joseph and Mary. That tells you. That's what he's saying he's rebutting him on. Because, oh, no, no. People think and make a mistake. They read John, they think John's saying Jesus is born God. No, doesn't say that. Verse 1 1, the word was God, right? So Jesus says he's not, Jesus himself says, I'm not God. And John 17 1 to 3 says, There's only one true God, the Father. And he addresses the Father, says, Father, you are the only true God. <laughs> so you, you know he's excluded himself from being God. So when it says the word was God, that can't be Jesus because Jesus may be called the word or had the name the word because the word what? The word comes to dwell in flesh in verse 114 and 18. Ergo, the word or God dwells in Jesus and Jesus in John 14, 10 says the father dwells in me. So it's not hard to understand the father, the word are identical. They're both, they're both words for God. Father is, a, is God, word is God. Word, father come to dwell in Jesus, boom. So 
uh, anyway, so being the offspring of Joseph and Mary doesn't change the fact that at some point in time, the Father and the Word, and they're the same, come to dwell in Jesus. And the original Gospel of Matthew shows that it happened at his baptism when God says, this day I've begotten thee. And the dove comes to rest, uh, comes, comes down to, to Jesus, and then f basically flies into his chest. Basically, he disappears into his chest. He comes to dwell in Jesus, and that's when it happened. It says he received Christ at his baptism. Okay, so that's correct. As a divine power revealing the unknown Father, the Christ left Jesus before the Passion and the Resurrection. So this is saying that the Christ, or the, I guess, the Holy Spirit, or the uh, the dwelling of God, left him before the Passion and the Resurrection. Well, that's an interesting conjecture, maybe, you know, because Jesus cries out, like, why have you forsaken me? So maybe that is Jesus' own mention of that, that perception that he that God had left him, because, you know, basically, if Jesus is going to be an atonement, then all the sins have to be poured on him, and the punishment of all those sins have to be poured on him, so maybe God steps away. It's possible. So it's an interesting conjecture. God, we, We're not told one way or the other in Scripture. Uh, Serenthus admitted circumcision, which means he accepted it, and the Sabbath. Yes, Sabbath's important, and that's in the Ten Commandments, and held a form of millenarianism, which would mean that we're waiting for a millennial kingdom to be inaugurated, I think. Okay. So he has some things that are good, some things that aren't so good. Could be a miscommunication. Um, I don't know why John would have to write a gospel because of anything I'm, I'm reading here. So this is how it comes out. He's a Jewish Christian. He allegedly has Gnostic tendencies, which means he's teaching you could be saved by Gnosis or knowledge of some kind. I, I did not get that from him. That would be a faith alone gospel. You know, you have to believe in facts that Jesus died was buried and rose from the dead. That's Gnosticism, pure and simple, ladies and gentlemen. You're told it's not, but it is. <laughs> Those are facts. You just don't have to do anything. You just believe in these facts and you're saved. So Gnosticism, when it was first being uh, uh, criticized by the early fathers, it was indistinguishable from Paul's doctrines, but nobody, those those passages or those criticisms, if they ever existed, were expunged because later Paul became essential to Constantine's mission to get rid of worship on uh, Saturday and move it all to Sunday, the God to the the day to worship his God of the sun. So I don't think there's any basis to say these people were Gnostics from what I see. Two, apparently they taught the world was created by angels. So I'm going to emphasize the word apparently. That means it's not for a fact known. Three, from whom the Jews received their imperfect law. Well, are they claiming it was imperfect? Now, Paul taught the law given by angels. The law was given by angels in Galatians 3 and 4. And for this reason, you need not obey the law given to Moses. That's, you know, a fact. Would these people be teaching that? It seems strange if they're Jewish Christians. But uh, I, I would say those things are probably not true based on what else we're reading here, because why are they admitting the Sabbath and circumcision? Maybe this idea of an imperfect law meant there was some laws that gone into the Bible that are Ill illegitimate. So we'd have to assess, well, maybe there's something like that that has happened. Maybe we, but we would need proof of that. And and things like that can happen because God tells us sometimes lying scribes have been involved in preparing the scripture. And J Jeremiah points it out and they had to be caught at what they were doing. And then that had to be taken out of the Bible. So you know, we don't know the whole process, but we know it happened because Jeremiah talks about it. Okay, uh, now, four, Jesus was the offspring of Joseph and Mary. Okay, that is in line with what we know about the the Ebionites from other things. So Serinthus and the Ebionites would share that common value or that common understanding. Jesus, now, this is interesting. Five, Jesus received the Christ, which I would understand is the word Christ or Christos is really anointing, the, the you know, so, or is it a separate being? I mean, it's very... Uh, unclear to me. I would just simply say, yes, he received the Christ, the anointing of Christ at his baptism as a divine power. Yeah. that, And in that anointing came the Holy Spirit f to dwell in Jesus bodily. And it was the word, meaning it's God's entire logos are in Jesus. And then Jesus would say, the logos is not mine. So he, 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 he disassociated himself completely from the logos that was in him had nothing, it was not his own. It belonged to the Father and only the Father, And he, but he would basically be the vessel, vessel by which these words would come out of him, and he would speak the words of God. 
this is a very different kind of prophet than any other kind of prophet that ever existed, that God's dwelling in him directly and God is speaking directly right through him. Okay, and then uh, 6, it says Christ or this anointing, this indwelling left Jesus before the Passion Resurrection. Speculative, maybe it's true, maybe they did have this view, I don't know. But that doesn't make them evil or good or good or bad. It's just that's their point of view. Seven, uh, they admitted or accepted circumcision. Well, that's not remarkable. That's in that's a if they're Jewish, they're sons of Abraham. They're supposed to be circumcised. They can't. It's a, and it's an eternal covenant. Remember that Abraham's covenant was never to go away. Paul even says because it's an eternal covenant, you he argues actually in Galatians that you God did not have a right to bring the Sinai covenant because. You, because he says, you, like in human law, you can't you can't have another covenant once you've had a first covenant. That you you you. So the second covenant is an, a nullity. So that's how he got rid of the. He gave two reasons why the law of Moses was nullified. One was that there was a original covenant with Abraham, and you're not allowed to abrogate that. That's in Galatians two and three, I think. And then he gives a second ground is that the law of Moses was given by angels, not by God. And therefore, why do you want to be subject to those who are no gods and who are weak and beggarly elements and basically eradicates the law in um, Galatians 3 and 4? So these people are definitely not followers of Paul. They believe that doctrine is apostate. And it is. It's on its face. Paul, Paul is an apostate. <laughs> but Paulinists will say, well, Paul is free to abrogate the entire law. And when you advocate Deuteronomy 13, the law of apostasy, then Paul can't be an apostate by definition because the law was abrogated. And my answer is, but who did this? Paul. Oh, so Paul can abrogate the very law that is used to test him and tr try him as an apostate. Yes, that's their answer. Yes, he's allowed to do that. <laughs> it's incredible stuff. Anyway, and then uh, they, the Sorrentus admitted Sabbath. So he's on the right side there. And taught we are in the premillennial stage. Don't know if, whether we are or aren't. I haven't really thought about it. To me, I just take one day at a time. If we're in a thousand year reign now or it's coming future, and I know it's going to come in the future, but is it already happening? I don't know. That's requiring me to see what their arguments are. So anyway, that's the uh, the summary of what Sorrentis is. I would say he's uh, he's got some good points. He's got some not so wonderful points. If he said the law is imperfect, maybe he meant one little thing. Uh, if he said the world was created by angels, well, that's Paul's doctrine. I doubt he said that. And it says the word apparently, so I don't think it. So I think actually if you get rid of the the unsubstantiated claims that they had Gnostic tendencies and this, quote, apparently statement and uh, uh, everything else looks pretty reasonable, I think, and, and or at least not heretical, but yet they're categorized as uh, her heretics. So let's go to the next one. I'm going to stop. Okay, and I'm going to do the next one fairly quickly is, this is Carpocrates. Remember, it was cited by Arrhenius. They have an opinion of the Lord similar to that of Carpocrates. And obviously what they mean, uh, what Arrhenius means, if that was truly Arrhenius speaking, is they also hold that Jesus was the son of Joseph. And that's at 1.25.1. Otherwise, they're Paul, a Paulinist sect. They no longer were bound by the Mosaic law. Uh, they, they Hold on here. They do not regard Paul inferior to Jesus when Jesus says the master, the one who sent is not greater than his master. Uh, they believe the law is mere human opinion. Um, they are strongly antinomian, according to Clement. Um, that compares well with Arrhenius saying they're no longer bound by Mosaic law. They have this strange uh, view that all property and women should be held in common. Uh, I don't want to say that's a Pauline view or a non-Pauline view because uh, Paul doesn't make that very clear and that's sort of a you know way beyond anything paul said you know but that's that's the sect they're a very very strange group of, uh, they believe in clement stramata they clearly do say carpocrates and epiphanes think that wives should be in common how about that strange stuff strange stuff when you get into paul doctrine about the law and once you break down all legal barriers to all kinds of immorality breaks out in my opinion and this is a perfect example but otherwise the fact that someone believes that jesus was born the son of joseph at that time was about 180 a.d that should be normative meaning the the the, the uh, gospels have not yet been fully corrupted i mean started maybe around 140 finished by 160 70 that they were corrupted but, uh, you know, I would think that it wouldn't, nobody would think that's a remarkable fact at a time. So I, I kind of wonder if this is truly originally um, 
Carpocrates was originally cited here because that's not that big a deal at that time. Would Arrhenius be concerned about that issue? No, I think he would not. Okay, so anyway, that's it. I uh, hope this uh, helps. This is our first installment on getting to know who the Ebionites are, the, the historical mention of them, which is pretty scant, so you have to dig it all up. And if the, uh, But we've made uh, the first headway here, and I think we can see they were definitely uh, consistent with what we would regard as the uh, Jewish original church, and the original church was centered at Jerusalem, James was the bishop, and the twelve apostles served. You know, basically, were uh, were headquartered there at this church known as the Abion, and then they would fan out and spread the spread the gospel to different countries, to different countries. Okay, I hope this helped, and look forward to episode two in this series. God bless. Take care. Ciao. Bye.